Um, I am by no means an expert at mock. So if you came here hoping to hear from somebody who knows it all, my apologies in advance. Um, I kind of learned, well, trial by fire is probably the best way to, ex to explain how I learned how to use mock. Um, so if you are an expert and I totally get something wrong, I'd love to be educated after the fact. So find me somewhere and let's talk. So um, just real quick poll here. How many of you have used mock? Okay, a few. How many of you know what mock is? How many of you have been afraid of kind of digging in and using mock? Okay, awesome. <laughs> I, I hope to, um, you know, push aside some of those fears. It's, it's confusing at first, but not as bad as you might think. Um, so of course, before you can get started, you have to have mock, and if you're using Python 3, it's part of the standard library, so you can import it from unit test. Uh, if you're still in Python 2, like me, uh, pip install mock is the best way to get it. So, what is mock? Um, I pulled this, I, I think it's like the first sentence on the official docs, and I'm going to read it. Mock allows you to replace parts of your system under test with mock objects and make assertions about how they've been used. So, that's actually a dense description, and there's a, lot of, there's a lot of content here, so I want to highlight a couple of things. You replace parts of your system. So the code that you're testing, you're actually going to, during your test, replace those with mock objects. And then the way that you do testing is that you essentially introspect those objects or make assertions on how those objects were accessed or how methods were called. So it's kind of a different way of thinking about tests. And um, based on a little scientific um, you know, inquiry, that is, watching people complain about using mock on Twitter, um, I've come to the conclusion that this is most people's typical first experience with mock. Uh, it's kind of a confusing and daunting experience. It was totally my first experience with mock. So what I want to do for the rest of this talk is just kind of show you some of the things that I do with mock. Um, I'm going to dig into some code. Um, but first, let's, let's stop and talk about unit testing for a bit. How many of you do unit testing? All right, cool. Um, so I use mock primarily within unit tests. And um, so kind of your quintessential unit test is you're going to exercise a piece or a unit of your code. Uh, it's often a function or a method. Um, you call the code, you verify side effects. Maybe if it's a class, you modify some state, like you might check the attributes on a class. Um, so I've come up with this really contrived example of something that we can unit test. So I've got this function, right? And you give it a couple of parameters and it returns a result. So a unit test might look like this. Uh, so we have a test case with a test add method. And to test our add function, we just call it. I know what parameters I'm passing in. So I know what sort of result that I should get. And I can verify that I get the right result, right? So here. I know 40 plus 2 should be 42, right? Pretty straightforward. So what if I decide that, you know, adding things locally, that's not cool. Let's, let's call out to a REST API, and I will, you know, hit this API, pass out my uh, uh, parameters, and I use requests, because that's the best way to talk HTTP. And so I'm calling an addition service. I can still test this the same way, but there's a problem. I've suddenly introduced a dependency, right? Um, actually, not just one dependency. My test becomes fragile because what? Because why? What's wrong with this? Any ideas? The service could be down. I have, like when I'm running tests, I have to have a connection to the network. Like if you're like me, sometimes that's not always possible. Uh, my home internet service seems to be flaky. So like running tests, when my internet goes down, suddenly breaks. 
So this is a good, this is a good chance to use mock. So what I'll do is replace part of my code with something I can inspect. I'm going to replace requests with a mock object. And then when I call request.post, I can make assertions that that method was called, that it had certain inputs, and that you know, things were called a certain way. So let's talk about mock objects. They're flexible objects that replace other parts of your code. Mock objects are callable. Um, you can take a mock object and access an attribute. And what happens is mock remembers that you accessed an attribute and gives you a new mock object. You can call any method on a mock object, and it will, again, give you another mock object. And mock remembers what you do. So you can make assertions about how you called things, the order in which they were called, what parameters were passed in. So let's look. Uh, once you've got mock, you can uh, create a mock instance. You can inspect it, and um, so you see that you have a mock with a particular ID. And then I can just access some arbitrary variable. And notice what happens here. I got a different mock object. So this is a totally brand new instance of a mock object. Then I could call a method, and I, you know, this is just an arbitrary method with arbitrary parameters, and it gives me yet another mock instance. And then that method, I can say, you know, assert that it was called once with this input, and if for some reason my code called this differently, this thing would raise an assertion error. So mock objects are pretty flexible. Uh, you can do a lot of things with them, and some people will use mock objects as objects in their test cases. Um, but creating mock objects is not how I typically use mock. Mock has this function called patch. And patch is just kind of a shortcut function that says, replace this piece of my code with a mock object. So patch itself gives you mock objects. Uh, patch also seems to be the thing that's confusing for a lot of people. So the problem is, where to patch? So let's go back to this um, code example where I hit this API service. Um, I'm going to split it up into a main module and a test module. And you know what I really want to do is replace requests with a mock object. So how do I do that? Well, requests, when you import it, it's referenced from within the main module. And you want to patch where your code looks for something, or where it looks for an object. So um, what I'm going to do is typically requests will reference the request library. When I use patch, what's going to happen is that from the perspective of the main method, request is now going to point at a mock object. And so patch just kind of does this behind the scenes for you. And here's what the test looks like. So the key points are here and here. I import my add service, that's the function that I'm testing. And then I patch, and here's the part where a lot of people get tripped up. I patch the requests module, or the requests library in the main module. So main.requests. That bit of code is the where am I patching bit. So just as a show of hands, how many, how many of you got tripped up on this the first few times you used patch? Okay, cool. So the rest of this test is uh, pretty straightforward. Um, patch is interesting. Uh, it, it is a flexible tool. Uh, you notice that I'm using it as a context manager here. Uh, I've got some other examples where I'm using it in different ways. So as a context manager, I can get a reference to uh, the mock object that it replaces. So with patch main.requests as mock requests. So mock requests is itself a mock instance. What I'll do is call my add service. I'll pass in some parameters. And then here's the point at which I verify that requests was called the way that I expected it to be called. So uh, in my code, I call request.post and pass it uh, this URL and a dictionary of data, right? 
So what I'm doing is I'm saying that the mock requests module was called with the post function or method. And then I'm asserting that it was only called one time and that it had these parameters, right? So if the code that I'm testing ever, if I ever changed any of this, this test would suddenly begin to fail. So this is, this is why I started using mock. Uh, building work for Pi, we hit a lot of third party uh, APIs. And I'll admit, my first uh, group of tests hit APIs. And so it was a pain in the butt when I lost a, um, an internet connection or if GitHub goes down for some reason, like suddenly my entire test suite fails. And I can't deploy because, right, you run your tests before you deploy, right? And um, I was just kind of stuck. So I looked into mock and solely for this reason. Get rid of network access, uh, anything that hits the network. Um, and then, you know, once I kind of wrapped my head around mock, I, I thought, wow, this is cool. I can use it for many things. And these are a couple of the other scenarios uh, that I really began to, to use mock for. Uh, one of my favorite is testing exception handler code. And so that's my next example. So uh, assume that you've got this. Again, we're using requests. And we just hit some URL and uh, get the JSON response, convert that back to a Python object, uh, and wrap it in a try accept block. All right? So testing this is pretty straightforward. You could test it using mock like we just saw. But what about this bit? Right? How many of you test your exception handler code? Right? If you want to get at 100% coverage, you've, you've got to actually test this bit. So the problem is, in my tests, how do I make requests have a connection error? Or how do I force requests to have an HTTP error? Right? Mock is actually something good for this case. So what I'm going to do again is replace requests with a mock object. But I'm going to tell my mock requests object, hey, throw a connection error or throw an HTTP error. So here's the code. So I'm patching requests again, right? I get a reference to this mock requests object. I'm going to use something called a side effect. So mock has this thing called side effect. Uh, and itself is pretty flexible. Uh, there are several things you can do with it. Um, my favorite thing to do with side effect is just assign it some sort of exception class. Um, and what happens is, any time that I call request.get, mock's side effect will be thrown, right? So it will raise a request.http error. So this is cool. Suddenly, I can control how request breaks my code, and now I can test my exception handlers. So now when I, I've imported my get content function that I'm testing, and I call it, pass in the URL, pretty straightforward. And what happens is, within that function, when I call request.get, it'll raise an exception. My exception handler gets tested. I can assert that request.get was called. And then I can assert that the result of calling that function gives me an empty dictionary, because that's what I decided to do in the case of a connection error or an HTTP error. How many of you use coverage? It's awesome. Only there are a lot of hands that didn't get raised. So um, I, I, this is a talk about mock, but I just don't think I could use mock without running things through coverage. So if you don't use coverage, go check it out. Um, basically, the way I would run my tests is coverage run, and then whatever Python command I use to run my tests. And it will report on how you know, what code gets executed. So this is actually how I discovered that all my exception handler stuff was not tested. I like, thought, yeah, I've got great test coverage. I feel good about deploying because all my stuff is tested. And then I ran it through coverage and found out 40% coverage is not so great after all, right? Um, so definitely check out coverage. <laughs>
So again, mock side effect controls side effects of calling a method. It can raise exceptions. It can also um, do interesting things like produce dynamic results. Um, you can write a little function that returns an iterable. And every time you call a mock object that has an, an iterable side effect, it will return a new value. So I didn't put an example of this, but uh, check out the docs. There's some great examples of, of how that works. So two scenarios. Hitting third-party APIs, testing your exception handler code, and then the next thing is kind of testing expensive code. And when I say expensive, I mean, you know, this could be memory intensive, this could be I.O. intensive, this could be time. Like I might have some code that takes a long time to execute, so I can replace that with mock and just speed up my tests. So uh, here's yet another kind of arbitrary example. So imagine I've got this scientific whiz-bang class. And um, it's got, you know, the meat of this thing has this really cool, you know, science thing that might take a little bit of time. Uh, this code is actually a little expensive if you run it. Um, it doesn't, it's not quite as interesting as most scientific stuff. But, so, this begs the question. Right? How do I test this thing? How do I test my calc alpha and calc beta methods without having to wait on the, the internals of this class? Right? I don't, there, there's no way. Like, this would drive me crazy. I couldn't test this thing. Um, so what I will do is replace the internals with a mock object. And uh, the way I would do that is, again, with patch. So in this case, I'm using patch as a decorator. Um, and not, not just patch, patch has this patch.object thing which lets you take a class and replace a method. So what I'm doing is, um, I've got a reference to my scientific whizbang class. I'm going to replace that calc method. And I'm going to specify that every time I call this mock object, it should return some predefined value. And that patched version of that method gets passed into my test as uh, mock calc. So that way I have a reference to it. At the end of my test I can make assertions about how it was used. So I create an instance of my scientific whizbang. I call my calc alpha method. Um, and because I patched calc and I know what it returns, I can make assertions that, hey, it returned what I expected. But then I can also test that that internal method was called with uh, specific parameters. And I'll, I'll go back a couple slides. Notice calc alpha calls this with a 100 as a parameter. So that's an example, example of using mock to replace something that is, quote, expensive. Um, other things that I've done here uh, replace connections to Postgres. Um, I, I do a lot of Django development, and sometimes I will drop down and write uh, SQL. And uh, rather than trying to load some fixtures and kind of you know, figure out how to test accessing the database, I'll just completely replace that database cursor or that database connection and then make assertions on how that was used by the rest of the code. The other example are, are calculations or things that take computing power that might take too long. <clears throat> so the last class is a code that needs a lot of setup. And this is kind of ambiguous. Um, so what you can do is really customize mock objects and use them in place of other bits of your code. Um, so think any time you need a class that behaves a certain way, maybe uh, an instance of that class is used as input to some method or uh, as the internals for some method, but you can define the behavior so that it, it behaves the way you expect. That's not the piece of your code under test. The piece of your code under test just needs that so I can use a mock object to replace that. So customizing mock objects, you can set um, attribute values or return values of a method. You can even, even create chains of method calls. And here's an example of uh, something that might look like a user object. So this is another scenario 
Um, rather than loading fixtures or creating users on the fly, I might create a mock user object. So uh, I have this configuration dictionary. My user has a first name, a last name, and email. It also has a couple of methods, maybe a get achievement method. And uh, notice that I can define what that method will return when called. Uh, I also set up a side effect. So, you know, maybe when I call get age, I expect to get a value error. And I can create this mock object by just unpacking all that stuff uh, as parameters to mock. So when I play with that object, I call m.firstName, and I actually get Alan as a result. I can call my get achievement method and get an expected result. So I can call the get age, and I will expect that it raises uh, an exception. Another way to do this uh, is with something called spec. So mock has this thing called spec, and I like to think of it as a whitelist for um, attributes or methods. And what happens is anything that's in the spec, you can access or you can um, call. But anything that's not in the spec, if you call, mock will raise an attribute uh, error. So for example, um, and spec can just be a list of strings as names. So again, if I was creating a user object from a spec, I have a first name, last name, email, and a method. And I can say, here, mock, this is my spec. Create a, an object that has these attributes or methods. But you know, if I call anything that's not here, blow up. And this is really great for, um, I, I, I'm, I'm probably guilty of writing unit tests that also serve as regression tests at times. Um, but this is really great for you know, building yourself some insurance in the future when things change. Uh, you will break your mock tests. You, you'll break your tests if you go changing things. So here's an instance of using a spec object. So create my spec, create a mock object. I can call get full name, and I get a mock object returned. Um, but if I try to access something like a password that wasn't in the spec, mock says no. There's also something called um, an auto spec. So you can imagine that if you have a pretty complex object, um, typing out the spec is a bit time consuming, maybe more typing than you want. Um, auto spec is a tool that will introspect your, an object and create a spec based on what you have. So again, if I have a, a Django user, I can create an auto spec from a Django user with mock's uh, create auto spec function. So I grab an instance of a user, I pass in that instance to create auto spec, and I suddenly have a mock object that looks and acts just like a Django user object. So using mock, um, I create mock objects instead of loading fixtures. I create mock objects to use um, as parameters or arguments to other things that I'm calling in my tests. Um, I tend to narrowly define my mock object's behavior. So if it's a user object and I know the method that I'm testing only needs access to the first name and last name, that's the only thing I'll spec. Then in my code, if I like change things, I, I know that my tests will break. So that keeps me, that keeps me honest, I guess. Um, my tests very closely uh, test the code uh, what I expect the code to do. So I spend a lot of time relying on spec and auto spec objects as objects in my tests. So um, tips. When I was learning mock, um, I, I, it probably took me about a month before I felt comfortable with it. And um, I read the docs. The docs are really great. Um, but the docs are, they, they tell you kind of how to use mock. You know, what are some, some uh, scenarios? They don't really do a good job of kind of telling you the philosophy behind mock. So it kind of took me a while, maybe I'm slow, but it took me a while to, to kind of wrap my head around that. Um, but I think mock's docs are a really great place to start. But, but this is the way I learned how to use mock. Um, 
So if you're not familiar with Google site-specific search, uh, just put quotes around from mock import and search GitHub. And uh, you can see basically how everybody else uses mock. So I spent a lot of time kind of uh, digging through various um, existing projects, and I learned a lot just by reading other people's code. So that's it for, for Mock. Uh, that's what I've got so far. Um, I've been using Mock uh, pretty consistently now for about six months. Um, so I'm still, I, I still consider myself a novice. Uh, I really like the ability to um, speed up my tests. Man, it's just awesome to like, get rid of the I.O., get rid of the network stuff, and uh, go through a test suite really, really quickly. Um, which makes deploying, for me, a lot less painful. Um, so, I appreciate you guys for coming to this talk. Uh, kind of went by quick. Uh, but if you have any questions, I'd be happy to uh, attempt to answer them. Yes? Uh, quick question. If you're just getting started with uh, Python Web Network, um, at what point does Mach come into play? Because I know there's one school of thought that says you would write the test first, then write the code so that the test passes, and only continue after that point. So the question is, if you're just getting started with Python, at what point does Mach come into play? Um, and, and essentially, should you do test-driven development? Um, I, I, I'm not quite prepared to get into that holy war. Um, <laughs> I, I think there are merits of doing test-driven development, uh, but there are also scenarios where, like if you're just kind of doing exploratory stuff, test-driven doesn't make a lot of sense in my opinion. Um, as far as getting started with mock, um, I, I think if, if you're hitting a third-party API or a network resource, mock instantly makes really good sense. Um, otherwise, get comfortable using unit test uh, or whatever other testing tools you might be exposed to first, uh, and then come back. I, so mock, I think it shines when you're replacing portions of your code that access the network or have a lot of I.O. or, you know, are computationally expensive, either in memory or, or CPU time. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Next? Yes. I was wondering if you had any um, tips or patterns for dealing with um, sort of composing the mocking of a bunch of network uh, requests. So for instance, we'll, we'll mock out these sort of individual requests to get data, but then we want to test the larger function that sort of does all of that stuff together. Right. And we've never really found a good, clean way to <clears throat> mock out these requests that kind of happen in sequence uh, to a third-party API. Okay, so the question is, how do, you, how do you compose a lot of mock objects so that you can test maybe a third-party API in sequence? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to say I don't know the best way to do that. However, I, I've, this is probably the point at which I've abused mock um, because you can create mock objects and then d customize their behavior, but then on your mock object you can have uh, yet another attribute that is itself a mock object and you can customize its behavior. So you can build these really elaborate mock objects that uh, essentially behave exactly like any API that you want. Um, so I, I've done that, and it feels a little tedious. Uh, so I, there's, there's a trade-off somewhere, and I'm not so sure that I've found it. So rather than sort of mocking out, for example, request.post, you might um, mock a whole object and sort of replace, and have a post method sort of defined on that and return different values in sequence or Potentially, but I think at that point you're getting into functional testing. And um, like I, I'll be, admit, I'm, I'm not the, probably the best person to talk to about the best way to do functional testing. Um, the one thing that I have noticed is that when I really think about how I'm using mock, I, I realize that a lot of my methods or functions are really doing too much. And I break those into smaller components and refactor that code. And I, I think just using mock has made me more cognizant that, that 
it really is easier to test things and unit test these when you have really short, concise methods. Um, and so take, take a step back, look at your code, make sure that your methods are small, do one thing, are easily unit testable, um, and then you may find that some of the like elaborate mocking stuff goes away, or at least gets moved somewhere else. Yeah, so the, the comment was when you, when you get to the point where you're um, f creating a lot of elaborate mocks to kind of mimic an API, it's probably a better idea to, to uh, step back and create a fake backend for that sort of thing. Okay, so they use HTTP pretty, uh, which I'm not actually familiar with. So, anyone else? Yes. So the question is, uh, there was a, an example of a logging, um, there it was. Um, so that's a good question. You, uh, I mocked logging, yes, I did. Uh, not in these examples. And um, so when you look at this test, uh, you know, here I would, I would assert that, you know, my request call, but I would also throw in my mock logger and say, yes, this thing got logged with this particular information. Um, I, I've seen comments that I'm, people on the internet have said you're doing it wrong, right? You can, <laughs> I, I don't know, maybe. Um, yeah. Right, so uh, again, this is kind of similar to the, the fake backend. You can create your own logging handler for your tests, right? And then you can um, inspect that somewhere else. Um, I, for me, I, and I like mock, so I thought um, if I don't have a lot of elaborate logging, maybe I've got like a one-off logging, uh, just a couple of these, I, sure, I'll mock them. And um, it's not as pretty, but I will, I've nested my context manager, so with patch main requests, it's mock requests, and then under with patch main dot logging. Um, patch is really flexible. Uh, there's another thing that you can do. You can set up... You can call patch in like your test startup and get a reference to this patcher object and you can call stop and start on it. So you essentially set up your patching in your setup, keep references to those, and in your teardown you can stop those patching. So it's kind of, not, not globally, but at a, at a unit test level you can patch a lot of different things. So I will patch requests, I'll patch logging, um, I've got a, a library that does metrics and dumps those in Redis, so I will patch that stuff um, so I don't have to have a, a local copy of Redis running to run my tests. So, good question. Yes? Can I just make a comment on the logging thing? Sure. With, if you're using nodes as your test runner, it will actually capture the logging output, so if the test fails, you actually get to see your logging. Right. So that is sort of, I, I would say, an argument for not mocking out your logging. So, for... So point and counterpoint. <laughs> nose, nose will show you the logging error, so you don't have to test those. Counterpoint is, no, I want to test that this particular error message uh, you know, happened and my sysadmins can see, yes, I, this was tested. So good comments both. Anyone else? Can you whip and have multiple patches that you include? Cer certainly, yes. So you can... Um, can you can you nest your your context managers? Can you can you have multiple with statements here inside your test? Is that is that correct? Well, can you 
Oh, so patch multiple things with one call? I, I don't think so, but it, I may be wrong. Okay, so if you want to patch multiple things uh, with one call to patch, use the, the decorator method. I believe so. So the, the question was, essentially the question was, can you patch multiple things uh, with one call to patch? I'd have to go read the docs again before I did that. Yeah, patch is pretty interesting. There's a lot of ways to use it, which on one hand, there should be only one, right? Next question. So once you've mocked everything out like this, do you also do any integration testing? Maybe that you run less often? So say your, your scientific calculation example, you probably want to run the whole calculation every once in a while. If, do you do that? And then if so, where do you put those tests and how often do you so the question is, once you've mocked everything with unit tests, your, your integration tests, where do they go? Uh, how, how do you structure those, and how often do you run them? Um, I, you know, th this is probably a good conversation to have with more people than me. I, my integration tests tend to be um, not all that complex. And I, I have mocked things in integration tests just to to not hit the API, um, but you know, typically it looks like when I call to this, this thing should happen, and it should have this side effect. When I call a, you know, if I'm calling multiple APIs in one object, do I get something expected, and do they interact correctly together? Um, I. That's probably. I, I feel like I haven't answered your question, but I'm. Maybe it's over my head. All right, anyone else? I think uh, testing would probably be an awesome uh, open space. So I would l like, um, I, I don't remember which rooms are dedicated to open spaces, but if any of you guys want to uh, get together and just kind of swap war stories when it comes to testing, I think that would be kind of an awesome thing to do. Um, We've got a few more minutes. Uh, if there's any other questions, I'd be happy to entertain those. Otherwise, we can just... Uh... We have plenty of time, you know. <laughs> Keep rolling here. Yeah. So do, you, do you feel like you ever uh, over-mock? Do I feel like I ever over-mock things? Um, uh, I, I've looked back, and I think I'm at the point where, yes, I do. And it, it, are, it is those scenarios where... I've tried to mock up this whole API, and I've got this mock object um, that's mock objects within mock objects within mock objects, or where I'm doing a lot of um, chained method calls. Um, so the one scenario that, I, that comes to mind is um, tr trying to mock Django's ORM, right? Uh, so I will create uh, a mock object, and then you know, objects dot get some parameters, and maybe so. Maybe this is kind of getting in the realm of integration testing, where I might have a method that calls several queries, and um, really a, a view is is where this happens. So, like when I'm testing a view, and it maybe uh, hits the ORM four or five times with different things, and so I try to mock that all up at once. Um, those mocks get pretty big. And there, there's maybe a little code smell there. It feels like maybe I'm putting too much effort into it. Yes? Uh, one quick general question. Um, do you know of any resources for, uh, say, for instance, covering legacy public code with tests? Uh, so I, I, I can see how it would be very common where you have the test code that someone else already wrote So the question is, uh, what's the best way to um, start investigating test coverage for legacy code? Coverage. Coverage.py. Uh, yes? Also, working with legacy code, I think that is really good. Okay, working with legacy code by Kent Beck is another uh, tip. I, r I really like coverage. Um, 
I, I kind of feel bad because I, I, I just recently discovered it, and it, it's kind of like pull the veil from off my eyes that um, my code is not nearly as tested as I thought it was. Um, and because coverage will, so it runs your test suite um, within coverage, and then it knows what lines get called, um, and it will report on that, and it will give you this really nice HTML documentation that says, you know, it highlights the things that don't get tested in red. So you can browse through your code and say, oh, this, this, this code is not tested. And um, it's pretty customizable, so you can, uh, you can tell it, you know, report on just these modules or, or just this stuff. If I were digging into a legacy product um, and uh, I knew it didn't have very good test coverage or no tests, I would start using coverage right away. So I, I don't... Can't remember the the link, but just Google Python coverage. A comment on that: you don't even have to run your tests. You could just launch the application using coverage, use it for a day, and see what code has. Run. Okay, so that's cool. I didn't. So you can uh, use coverage to run your application, and it will. It's slower. It, it, right, and it will tell you what's what's getting used. That's that's awesome. I, I actually have some a project that that would come in handy. Thanks. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I mocked super. Um, yeah, the question was, have you mocked built-ins? And was that a code smell? Um, so I, yes, I've mocked the dictionary object. And um, right off the top of my head, I can't remember why I did that, but it seemed like a good idea at the time. <laughs> um, uh, I did get 100% test coverage, but I, I did mock super, and that, that, that was probably not a good idea. Like, um, but you can do it, and if you're really interested, I'll show you how I did it. Uh, the other, there, there's a few quirks with mock. Um, it's got a built-in uh, attribute that it wants to reserve called name. Each, each mock wants to keep a name. So... Unfortunately, I have a lot of classes that have a name attribute, and so there's a clash there. Um, so you can actually hack mock. Uh, you can monkey patch mock itself so that you can access the name, like, like you take over its name variable. And that's, looking back, that's a code smell. That, that feels wrong. Uh, I did that too, and, and uh, that's still in a bunch of my code. But yeah, mocking super... I, that, that's probably, I don't know, I don't even remember why I did it, but, uh, so yes, you can mock built-ins. All right, anything else? Well, thank you, I appreciate you guys' uh, attention and your time.